Let us open God's word to that passage that we read in Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. Last Lord's Day we considered uh, verses 1 to 8 under the title, The Voice of Comfort. And this morning we want to consider the rest of the chapter under the title, The God of Comfort. In verses 1 to 8, the emphasis was what God says, which brings much comfort to our souls. But in these verses from verse 9 to the end of the chapter, the emphasis is primarily who God is and what he has done. Just as a side thought, this is what separates Christ from all other religions. Christ not only spoke wonderful words, gracious words, loving words, but proved that he was the one of whom those words spake by his wonderful works, miracles, and preeminently in his resurrection. So we want to consider seven points in these verses uh, this morning and we want to begin in verse 9 with what we are calling the proclaimed God the God who is proclaimed in verse 9 notice in the ninth verse the people who proclaim this God it is Zion we are told in Hebrews that we have come to Mount Zion we have come to the heavenly Jerusalem, and we as the people of God, as the Zion of God, are the ones who proclaim this God. We are the only ones who can because we have experienced his grace, his mercy, his saving power. But notice also the purpose. It is a bringing of glad or good tidings. We have a message to proclaim the message regarding this God. But then there is preparation. There is the getting up into the high mountain. There needs to be a preparation. We can't just proclaim this God if we have not met with him. Getting up into the high mountain speaks of at least two ideas. It is going to meet with God, but then also to stand in a a lofty place so that as many people as possible can hear God's truth. This Thursday, God willing, we will gather in Dublin City. Some of us will gather there and we will proclaim this God. We will proclaim the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we now are preparing And we will look forward to that time and in the preparation of our hearts. But notice also, there is power in this proclamation. It is, O Jerusalem, that bringest good tidings. Lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up. In other words, the message is of such a nature that it is not to be just mentioned. It is to be proclaimed. This God is to be proclaimed. Be not afraid. Why? Because you speak on behalf of this God. We speak as his envoys, as his ambassadors. Say the the content of the message then at the end of the verse. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Look to God. See Him. This is one of the, again, in in the book of Hebrews, one of the the clear uh, ideas in that book is a, a lifting up of the eyes to behold the living and true God. This is the proclaimed God. The God that we proclaim. But then secondly, notice in verse 10, we have the promised God. The promised God, verse 10. Notice it says that he will come. And again, it begins with this word, behold, take notice of this. 
This is something to give the attention to that the Lord God will come. He will come in strength with a strong hand. He will come to rule. His arm shall rule for him. Behold again, getting the attention. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. God is not slack. The apostle tells us, as some men uh, consider so, our God is not slack. He will come. In fact, there's a sense in which our God is constantly coming to this world in saving power, but also in judgment, also in wrath, as Romans 1 verse 80. And there is a constant um, revealing of God in both ways in this world. We see God's judgment, but we also see his grace. Psalm 50 has this idea. Our God shall surely come. Keep silence, will not he? And we will sing that, God willing, at the end of uh, this message. So the proclaimed God, verse 9, the promised God, verse 10, and then thirdly, the protecting God, verse 11. He is a God who protects. He As a shepherd, he feeds, he gathers, he carries, he leads. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm. The question for us this morning is, do we know this God in this way? Is God distant to us? Is God uh, just some figment of our imagination? Or do we know experientially? Do we know practically this protecting power of God? Have we experienced, and we'll see this at the end of the chapter by way of application, have we experienced this protecting God? So he feeds, he gathers, he carries. Notice where he carries these lambs in his bosom. The love of God for his people. The love of God for his people. Loved with everlasting love. Someone wrote those words based on the scriptures. Loved with everlasting love. Led by grace that love to know. This is the God who protects his people. Who gently leads those that are with young. There's a gentleness. There is a uh, a lovingness with this uh, God. He does not treat us according to our sins, but treats us gently. And then we have fourthly in verse 12, the potent God or the omnipotent or the omnipotent God in verse 12. Notice in this verse, we have the dimensions of God's power. We have the depth, the width, the circumference, the weight of his power. Various dimensions. The depth who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand. This is the depth of God's power. The depth of his strength. Then we have what we might call the width of his power. He has meted out heaven with the span. The circumference of his power. And comprehend it, the dust of the earth, in a measure. And then the weight of his power. He has weighed the mountains in the scales and the hills in a balance. See, this is the God of comfort. This is our God. He is not only a protecting God. He is a powerful God. So we have the motherly idea in the previous verse, and now the the, the male or the fatherly uh, motif, if you like, in this verse. God comprehends all those wonderful relationships to his people. And then fifthly, we have the preeminent God in verses 13 and 14. The preeminent God, verses 13 and 14. And 14. Notice 
He as the source of all knowledge and wisdom does not need the help of any. Not to direct him, not to teach him, not to counsel him, not to instruct him in judgment or knowledge or show him the way of understanding. Though there are some who think that they can teach God today. There are some who think they know better than God. But our God is preeminent in all his wisdom, in all his knowledge, and does not need anyone to instruct him. This is stating the obvious, isn't it? You know how ridiculous it is for man to think that he has something to teach God, and yet man thinks he knows better. Man thinks he can correct God, but here Isaiah is saying, who has ever actually instructed God? Who has ever actually taught him or given him any new thought? It is ridiculous. It is nonsense to think such a thing. This is our preeminent God. And then, sixthly, we have in verses 15 to 25, the peerless or the incomparable God, verses 15 to 25. And there are, are four areas of God's peerlessness or incomparability. God cannot be compared to anything or nothing or no one can be compared to him. We have the nations, we have images, we have the inhabitants of the world, and then we have the leaders of the world. And just looking at these four briefly in these 11 verses. First of all, the nations are nothing compared to him. Verses 15 to 17. We have the illustration of a bucket. The the nations are as a drop of a bucket. And imagine if you're uh, washing a bucket or, or using a bucket to wash and there's just a few drops left in the bottom of the bucket. They're counted uh, as nothing. Just like the dust um, in the balance. It, it, it adds no weight. It is, it, it is irrelevant. The dust of the balance is nothing and this is what the nations are compared to god he takes up the isles as a very little thing he doesn't even feel the weight of the nations and of the lands and then because of that in worship lebanon if the whole of lebanon if the whole forest of lebanon was was burnt it would not be sufficient and if all the beasts thereof were, were burnt, they would not be sufficient to worship such a God. Nothing is sufficient. Nothing is enough for this God to give him his due worship. And that is why eternity will be needed if it were possible to exhaust the worship that is due to this God. Verse 17 All nations before him are as nothing. And again, it's not that God does not care. That's not the idea. It's that in comparison to the greatness and the glory and the majesty and, and the sheer immensity of this God, the nations are irrelevant. They're like a, a drop. They're like dust. They are, they, they're, they're nothing compared to this God and they cannot worship him sufficiently. But then secondly, images. Images are incomparable. How can an image represent this God? And the question is asked in in verse 18, To whom then will you liken God? How can you make an image of God? Or what likeness will you compare unto him? This God that is uh, immense, this God that is omnipotent, this God that is beyond any of our comprehensions and that we cannot teach, how can we represent him? How can we figure him? What the workman thinks he can. He melts a graven image and the goldsmith spreads it over with gold. They do the best they can. 
So they use the best materials. They put all their energies and efforts into making this thing, this image. And we can go to many so-called places of worship in this country and see statues and images, wooden and stone and other materials to represent God. It says in verse 20, He that is so impoverished that he hath no oblation chooses a tree that will not rot. So he, he doesn't have enough money for, for gold and silver, but he, he'll get the best of wood. This is what he can afford, so that a work, workman can prepare a graven image that shall not be moved. They're made by man. They're man-made. They're incomparable to God because they are made by the hands of men, by the wisdom of man. This man that is the dust of the earth, this man that is like a drop in the bucket, thinks that he can represent the true and eternal God. So Psalm 115 verse 4 to verse 8 tells us, Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, and they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not, neither speak they through their throat. Look what verse 8 says. They that make them are like unto them. So is every one that trusteth in them. You see, we do become like what we worship we become like what we worship that's not only a human proverb that's what the scripture says when we worship the true god we become more like him as second corinthians i think it's chapter three tells us if we worship an idol the word of god tells us we become like the idol The nations, nothing compared to him. Idols, images, nothing compared to him. And then thirdly, his power is incomparable to all the peoples of the world, which in comparison to him are like bugs, verses 21 and 22. Notice the fourfold interrogation of verse 21 have ye not known have ye not heard hath it not been told you from the beginning have ye not understood from the foundation of the earth there's an interrogation here there's a fourfold questioning do you not know this do you not uh, understand this have you not heard this that it is he, verse 22, that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, the sheer immensity of God, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers. They are like the small bugs of the earth in comparison to him, the one that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. The immense God, the sheer immensity of God, But then not just the people of the world, but the great men of the earth are as nothing beside him. Verses 23 to verse 25. Princes are nothing compared to him. Judges of the earth are vanity in comparison to him. Why? Because God is their king and he is their judge. Verse 24 says, Yea, they shall not be planted. Yea, they shall not be sown. Yea, their stock shall not take root in the earth. And he shall blow upon them. And they shall wither. And the whirlwind shall take them away as stubble. And it comes back then to verse 25. This whole section. To whom then will ye liken me? God lays out the challenge. God presents the challenge. Whether it be the nations, whether it be the the work of men's hands in, in idols and images, whether it be the whole population of the world, or whether it be the great men of the earth, none of these can compare to God. And you see, again, let me bring you back to the point of all this. The point is, 
to present to us the God of comfort. Because there can only be real comfort when there is something that is beyond us. Something that is greater than us. Don't we see in the the people of the world, the rulers of the world, they're no different. They're just like us. There can be no comfort in their strength and their wisdom. As this, as verse 24 says, they shall not be planted, they shall not be sown. The, the point is that they're, they're like a shifting shadow. They're not stable. The only one who is the rock, the only one who is the refuge, the only one who does not change is our God. Therefore, he's not... It's not just the voice of comfort, it is, it, is, it is God himself. Yes, God speaks comfort, and he tells us to speak comfort to his people in verses 1 to 8. But now God himself, in his very person, God is our comfort. God is our refuge and our strength. And then lastly, we have... The prevailing God. Three points on verses 26 to 31. On this prevailing or powerful God. We could also say. And we have the evidence. The encouragement. And the experience of his power. First of all. The evidence of his power. Verse 26. Lift up your eyes on high. In other words, see the evidence. See the evidence before your eyes. Even as we look out of the window, we can see the effects of the, the sun and, the, uh, and the, the plants outside this window. Lift up your eyes on high and behold who hath created these things that bringeth out their host by number. Lift up your eyes to the stars, he calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power, not one faileth. This is the evidence. See, the word of God brings us to examine that we have reason for comfort, that, that this God is not a figment of our imagination, that we live in a real world, with a real created order, with real stability, with, with seasons, with, with times and years and so on, that there's order and structure to the whole of the universe. So that some people live in constant fear that one day an asteroid or a meteor will hit the earth and destroy the earth. This is because they don't believe in the God who has ordered all things and that nothing can happen outside of his control. So that he is the creator and the sustainer and the preserver of all things. This is the God who brings up the sun every morning. That brings the rain as we have need. That has created all things for to be the evidence of his power and love to his people. This is our God. This is the real God. This is the incomparable God. God. That's the evidence of his power. But then, secondly, the encouragement to trust in his power, verses 27 and verse 28. Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord? In other words, why are you hiding in a corner and, and being depressed? Why are you giving up? Why are you being so discouraged? Why are you living your life like an atheist? Why are you living in practical atheism? And again, it comes back uh, to ask this interrogating and loving questioning again in verse 28. Hast thou not known? But there's a greater emphasis than the previous verse here. The previous was uh, to those who who were outside possibly of a relationship with God. In other words, it's generally to the world. But now this is to Jacob. Now this is to God's people. And again, it has the emphasis, has thou not known? 
previously it's to the whole world have you not known have you not heard have you not understand now it's to Jacob now it's to God's people hast thou not known Jacob Jacob thou dost know thou hast the word of God you do know so we're surrounded by a world who has limited of any knowledge of God but we know this God We know him. We have heard of him. We have seen him in his word. But the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. We have every reason not to be discouraged. And we have every reason to be encouraged this morning. Because all power is in him. That's why the Lord Jesus said those words, didn't he, in Matthew 28, when he's sending the disciples out to the world to preach the gospel. He says, all dunamis, all power in heaven and on earth is given to me. Therefore, go and and preach the gospel, make disciples of all nations. Why? Because all power resides in me. We don't have to be discouraged we don't have to doubt because this god this everlasting god the creator of the ends of the earth he doesn't faint yes we faint yes we get weary but he doesn't get weary yes we lack understanding but there's no searching of his understanding it is infinite eternal unchangeable this is our god The encouragement to trust, not in our own power, but to trust in his power. And then, lastly on this last section, the experience, the evidence, the encouragement, and now the experience. We mentioned this earlier. We need to experience this power. This is not just head knowledge. This is not just confessing some facts. Because this God actually gives power to the faint. How many of us, as the people of God, have felt at our end, at that very moment, our God comes with his power. Just when we feel that we cannot go on, we cannot take another step, at that very moment... At that very time and instant, God comes with his power to the one who is fainting. To them that have no might, he increases strength. You see, the Lord Jesus did not come to call the righteous, but he came to save the sinful. Do you feel this morning in yourself faint? Do you feel that you have no might, no power, no strength. But these are the ones, you are the ones, that this God comes to give his power, his strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. They have limited strength. And the young men shall utterly fall. In other words, they can only go so far they eventually we have that story don't we in in ancient greek history of of uh, marathon and he 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 runs the the 26 miles to bring the message and when he when he when he comes he he collapses and he dies a man of of great strength of, of great stamina and yet he drops dead even the young men shall utterly fall but They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And it all comes down to that little phrase, they that wait upon the Lord. That's the key. That's the key. The God of comfort is experienced when we wait upon him. Seek the Lord. 
look to him. We are worms of the earth, but we're made in him kings and priests to give glory and honor and praise by his strength, by his power, by his wisdom, by all that our God is. We have nothing, but in him is all things. And the more we investigate and spend studying our God and the attributes of God and who God is, the more we shall be able to tap into and experience the glories and the power of this God. The God of comfort. The God of comfort. May God bless his word to our souls. Amen. Let us sing from Psalm 50. Psalm 50, and we'll sing the, from verse 1 down to verse 6. Psalm 50, verse 1 to verse 6. The mighty God, the Lord, hath spoken and did call the earth from rising of the sun to where he hath his fall. Verse 3 says, Our God shall surely come. Keep silence shall not he. Before him fire shall waste great storms shall round about him be. Verse 5, Together let my saints unto me gathered be those that by sacrifice have made a covenant with me. Let us know this God of comfort, this God who does come, this God who is proclaimed, is promised, who protects, this God who is all-powerful, this God who is to be experienced by his people in as they seek him, as they know him. This is life eternal, to know thee the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Psalm 50, verses 1 to 6, to God's praise. The mighty God, the Lord, has spoken and did call the earth from rising of the sun to where he hath his fall from us of Zion Hill, which of its Declare 
Because the Lord himself is he, by whom men judge Let us come before this God in prayer. Let us pray. Lord, we simply want to pray as we've considered these verses that we might know Thee. That we would know in increasing measure this God whom to know that is the one who delivers us not only from wrath and brings us into saving relationship with Christ the God who fills us with his glory. Lord, that we might know according to the word of God and by the very Holy Spirit of God to know thee so that we might be truly comforted in a world that is so lacking in any real comfort, yes, It has many words and many nice thoughts, but without foundation. And this world trusts in the the great men of the world or the the scientists or and they are passing away and their knowledge is limited. But with our God there is no searching of his understanding. We cannot comprehend this God we find ourselves at the fringes but Lord we pray that thou wouldst bring us closer closer to thyself so that we might have intimate fellowship with with the true God O Lord enable us make us Lord to be students of the God of comfort so that we might be able to say with the psalmist God is our refuge God is our strength God is our fortress God is our high tower God is our confidence our boast our glory God is our God and this God who is our God will be our guide even unto death, even unto the end, but shall only be the beginning. For when he shall appear, this God who is coming, when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So Lord, bless us, forgive us for all our sins, Continue, Lord, with us the rest of this Lord's Day. And now, the, and now the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.